If you've got your Bible, turn with me to the book of James, chapter 1. Book of James, chapter 1. Um, I'm going to title my message this morning, something that's a little bit funny, but it's also something that I think we've all heard, right? The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. And as you're thinking on that and turning to James chapter 1, I'll read to you just the last verse of uh, How Firm a Foundation that we sang together this morning. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Praise the Lord. That is the promise, in different words, that we're going to focus on this morning. James chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. We're going to jump back to chapter 4 here. James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Let's have a word of prayer as we enter the message this morning. Jordan, would you pray for me, please? <coughs> Amen. In the book called Men at Work, which is written by an author by the name of George Will, the book takes kind of a close look through the careers of four different baseball players, one of which, uh, if you know much about baseball, and I'm not a big follower of it, I, I'm not a follower of it really at all anymore, um, but it's still a name that I've heard and somewhat recognize, and that's the name of Oral Hershiser, who was a pitcher for the Dodgers for many years. And, and uh, Mr. Will, the author, talks to Mr. Hershiser about his philosophy as pitching, and he says there's two theories of pitching. One of them is that you try to convince the batter that a particular pitch is coming and then you throw something different that they're not expecting. The other theory that you don't hear nearly as much but that I use, said Oral Hershiser, is that if the batter expects a particular pitch, you throw it, but you throw it in a place where he can't hit it. What's he saying? Know what the batter expects and throw the ball almost there in that spot. If he's a batter that likes the pitch to come in high and that's where he hits well, well, throw it high, but throw it just a little bit higher than normal so that it's so enticing he can't help but swing, but it's pretty hard to hit it well. And this morning I feel like that that's just the way that the enemy of our soul, Satan, works in our lives. You know, Satan doesn't come at you with, most often, he doesn't come at you with exactly the opposite of what you expect and try to break you down that way. In fact, he pretty much knows, just as we do, what our weaknesses are. He knows what it is that entices us, and then he brings something our way that's just kind of close to what we expect, but just a little bit off of it. It looks so good, it feels so right, but if we're to cave to it, it really is so, so wrong. Webster defines the term temptation as the act of enticement to do wrong by the promise of pleasure or gain. The act of enticement to do wrong by the promise of pleasure or gain. Isn't that just like Satan? 
Isn't that exactly what he does to our souls? You know, sometimes um, when God allows us to suffer, we have a tendency to use the hard times, the difficult times, the trials as a excuse for slipping or doing wrong or in many circles just out and out sinning. Hard times certainly can lead to temptation. Satan knows when to jump on us. He knows when we're discouraged. He knows when we're weak. He knows when we're down. And that's the time you can just expect him to come slipping in and offer something that seems so enticing and so pleasing, but really is the wrong thing to do if we're to bite on it. Sometimes Satan, I feel like, comes and he tries to whisper in our ears that what we just need is a little bit of pleasure in our life to help ease the pain or to help numb the pain that's there. He'll tell us that we should be angry with God, that if God was truly a loving God, He would never make us suffer such an overwhelming loss or difficulty or tragedy in our life. Satan gets to the point he tells us we ought to be bitter and we should even resent God. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly what he does and has done since the time of his casting out of heaven. The devil knows all the tricks, and he'll always pull out his best ones on us when we're at our weakest. But I want to remind you this morning, at any time when you're under temptation, you should never, ever say, well, God's tempting me. No, no, no. Uh-uh. Verse 13 here is very clear in James chapter 1. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and neither can he tempt any man. Now, if we've got temptation coming, it's by way of Satan. You say, well, how do I know if it's temptation? Sister Grisham said a really good thing in the Sunday school lesson this morning, and I don't know that it caught. I think it just kind of flew over most of your heads. She said, if it's rushed, if it's pushed, if they're saying the decision has to happen now, that's not the way God works. That's the way Satan works. He pushes you quickly to make a decision. It's in an instant that he wants you to fail and to slip and go the wrong direction. If it doesn't make sense, if it doesn't add up, if you're a little bit confused by whatever it is, God is not the author of confusion either. God's not the author of confusion. But you know, most often if temptation comes and for whatever reason we slip and fall to it, then it's pretty easy to say, well, it's because of this or it's because of that or the devil made me do it. You ever heard a little kid say that? Now, it's real bad if you hear an adult say that, right? I think we've probably heard adults say it, and that's just, well... That's just sad. I, maybe there's a better word for it, but probably not one I should use from here. Um, anyway, it's just a sad state of affairs. If somebody as an adult really thinks the devil made them do it. But I've heard little kids say it. In fact, when I was a little kid, I'd be shocked if I didn't say it at some point, right? But, but what is that really? When someone says the devil made me do it, what is that really? It's trying to cast off your bad actions and your bad decisions and faults onto some other entity, onto somebody else. And so I would just ask you this morning, whatever your actions are, are you really accepting responsibility for them? When you do something wrong, do you just admit it or do you blame somebody else? Um, there's an epidemic going on, and I mean besides the one that they're trying to blow out of proportion out there as far as illness is concerned. There's an epidemic going on in our society of people failing to take responsibility for their own actions or even their own inactions, right? Well, I'm not going to work, so you should pay for me to be able to live. Well, um, my Bible still says if you're not willing to work, neither should you also eat. And I understand the lesson this morning is on a balance of truth and love, but um, I think that's pretty clear truth, right? And I hope I can share that with someone lovingly. And you know how I do that? I say, the place that I work is hiring every single day. I'll be happy to serve as a reference for you. And you know what happens? Usually they walk away or the phone gets hung up or whatever, right? Well, that's not where I was really going with this. But it's good truth anyway. Everyone seems to blame anyone or everyone else. They say, it wasn't my fault. Well, that's nothing new. In fact, it's been the case since the days of Adam and Eve. It's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. 
When, when Adam and Eve heard the sound of God walking in the garden after they'd fallen in sin, what did they do? They ran and they hid. And the Lord calls out unto Adam and He says, Where are you? And Adam answers him and says, I, I heard that you were coming. I heard you coming. I was afraid because I was naked and I ran and I hid. And God says, Who told you you were naked? Now that part hadn't changed. Just the reality of it had changed. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you from which not to eat? And Adam answers and says, The woman that you gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate it. What happened? Adam not only blamed Eve, he blamed God. Yeah, he did. He not, yeah, sure, he blamed Eve. That's the first thing we'd all think of, right? And it's still fun to blame my wife once in a while, but 99.9% .9 of the time, it's my fault, not her fault, right? When something goes wrong, uh-oh, now I got it going. But the sad thing is when people blame God. He says, oh, Lord, it's your fault. You gave her to me. If she had never been here, I would never fall. Well, I don't think that's true. He still had a choice to make. He made the choice, and then he tried to pass off the blame. He didn't have to eat it. It was Adam's fault. He yielded to temptation. Now, friends, God permits temptation, but he never directs it. He's never the cause of it. God does not direct us as his prized creation into sin. He's given us a free will to make our own choices, but very clearly God hates sin. And I agree, Sister Grisham, with what you said this morning. We don't use... 1 John, or I'll add 2nd or 3rd John, enough, probably. But in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, God is the light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. What's that mean? God cannot and will not fellowship with sin. He can't tolerate it. He won't direct us anywhere near it. And when we sin, we sin because it's our choice. It's because we went there. The devil didn't make you do it. You did it. Now, I'm going to assume most of us here this morning at some point in our life have been fishing. Everybody been fishing at some point, at least a little bit, right? When you go out to catch a fish, it's kind of important that you know the body of water you're going to and know at least just a little bit about it. And why is that? Well, because uh, you need to know what type of fish you can expect to find there, right? Because depending on what kind of fish you want to catch, you've got to use different types of bait. Now, I quite enjoy eating like little bluegill and sunfish and red ear and crappie. Those are pretty good right? They're some of the best tasting freshwater fish, at least, in my opinion, uh, at least that I've been able to have. I know there's, you know, uh, pike and some of those in the northern states that I've not been able to eat, and I hear those are pretty good. But for around here, um, bluegill and red ear and crappie, those are kind of the thing. And so if I'm going out to catch them, uh, I'm probably going to grab an earthworm or something like it, right? Some people use crickets, but something like that that's specific to them, things that they like to eat. If I'm going to catch a bass, which is more sport, right, and generally less for food, you're less likely to eat those. They're still pretty good, but if you want to maintain the ecosystem of your pond, you don't want to pull all the bass out. They're the ones that keep the system in balance. And so, but if you're going to catch them, you want to use a minnow or something that looks like it, right, a fake lure or, or maybe a great big worm or something of the sort to catch them with. If you're going out uh, catfishing, you might use chicken livers or even corn or something, right, kind of something that they're used to. If you're going out on salt water, you might throw shrimp. Or if you're trying to catch great big fish like swordfish or uh, something like that, they'll take um, squid and cut it up and put it on the hook. They use all sorts of different things. But what's my point? You have to know how to entice what it is that you're trying to catch. The bait has to be specific. Well, chances are very high that the temptation that is the best alluring bait for me is probably very different than what is your weakness and what will be alluring to you. We're different species, so to sorts, right? We're all humans, but the devil knows each and every one of our weaknesses. He knows our weak points. He knows what bait is most alluring, and because of that, as he learns us, he will cast those and dangle them there. Now, we're no different than a fish. All a fish has to do to be perfectly safe is just stay where he's at and ignore the bait. And he has nothing ever to worry about. But you know what happens? It's enticing. 
He's got this idea of what seems to be a quick and easy meal there, this short-term pleasure that's going to come and feed his perceived need. And so more often than not, eventually some fish is going to lash out and they're going to grab it and grab hold. And we all know what happens after that. They end up somebody else's dinner. And quite frankly, I quite enjoy it. And by the way, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. My Bible still says the animals were given to us for meat. Right? Nothing wrong with that. But I'm drawing an analogy this morning, and that's that if you and I will just leave the bait alone, we have absolutely nothing to worry about. You know, God's not going to come down and beat us with a pole out of the hole and say, go bite the bait. No, no, no. No, in fact, he's not even the one holding the pole on the other end of the line. He has nothing to do with it. What do we have to do? Just stay safe. Just stay hidden. Just stay tucked away in that rock of ages that's there. Just stay step by step with him and hand in hand with him, and we're perfectly safe. Just don't take the bait. Boy, that sounds so easy, doesn't it? But it's so appealing. We've got to be careful. But ultimately, it's our choice. Do we bite or do we not bite? I don't want there to be any mistake about this. The best fishermen in all the world, as far as sinful bait is concerned, is Satan. He knows where our weaknesses are. He knows where our temptations are that we're most likely to fail and most likely to fall for. He knows the best bait on each and every one of us, and he's going to put it out there. The key is, by the way, Jesus gave us the perfect example of it in the Lord's Prayer, right? Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Why did he, te why did he pray that? Because I think it's a real smart thing for us to get up every morning and say, Lord, would you open my eyes to the temptation that Satan's going to put before me today? Would you just reveal through your light the wrong things that are going to come across my pathway? And the best way to do that, by the way, is to have the internal indwelling nature of the Holy Spirit with you in everything that you do and everywhere that you go, and he'll just show you real clearly what's right and what's wrong. That's one of the powers of the Holy Spirit within you. We'll get to that here in just a minute. And you know, not every sickness that we have or illness can be cured by the same medication. Now, I guess maybe that depends on the person. There's some people that all you have to do is give them uh, some sugar pill that actually does nothing at all and magically all their problems are cured. Why? Because they were all in their head in the first place. I think we all probably got problems like that too. The things that we call big problems really aren't big problems at all if we just leave them alone and go on about our life. We worry about the wrong things. But then there are actual issues that we need cured, and it takes specific medication to, to cure specific issues. Well, not all temptation can be overcome by the same version of resistance. What do I mean by that? If you face sensual sin or sexual sin, run. Run. When you face the sin of gossip, Hold your tongue. Keep your mouth shut. When you face the sin of laziness, go to work. When you're filled with the sin of bitterness, forgive. Intentionally forgive. If your sin has been holding back and not giving the Lord what is rightfully His, well then, you'd best give. Right? Not all temptation is overcome in the same way. But they all do have a way of escape every single time. God will not put anything on us in the way of temptation that he's not given us the way of escape. You say, well, is sin really all that pleasing? Sometimes this is hard to admit, to admit, but the bottom line is there is pleasure in sin. There is. It can be fun. It can have pleasure. It can have... Um, an allure of sorts. Uh, th there's a reason that people risk their reputations and their careers and even their families just to taste the flavor of sin. If the bait on the end of the hook didn't look like something that was good to eat, the fish would never bite it. And we're the same way. If it didn't somehow seem pleasing or pleasuring, then it really wouldn't be a temptation. But here's the key. It might seem pleasing, and it might be pleasing, or it might be fun, but it's for a very, very short period of time, and then it's incredibly destructive. Its end is death. And then this time-tested rule, there's a couple of time-tested rules of Scripture that come out. 
One of them is, be sure your sins will find you out. And the other is, you will reap what you sow. It's not fun very long. And in the long term, I would say, it's not fun at all. In fact, it has absolutely no measure of significance at all when you weigh it up against the perfect joy that comes from being a child of God. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Complete and total real freedom. And on the other hand, you've got sin that is sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly, but in any case, constantly leading a person to death. If you ever had to watch somebody, maybe a loved one, maybe somebody else you know, slowly just wither away and die from some disease, it's not a pleasant thing. It's not fun at all. It's not pretty. And it's exactly what sin does to us spiritually. I about got ran out of a funeral one day because I stood up there and I said, the best thing that ever happened to this lady who had just passed away was that she got cancer. And oh, I thought I was going to get run out of the place. But it was the truth because what happened? She got saved because of it. She saw the end coming, right? I've got a couple of family members that have the exact same story. I, I believe the primary reason they're in heaven today, besides the fact that they had faith and asked Jesus to forgive them, is that God gave them time and a reason to do so by giving them the awful disease of cancer. It's not a fun thing to watch, but sometimes it has a purpose. But here's the key. God is not obligated to do that. God could at any moment decide your time is up. That's it. So what should we do? We should walk in the light as he is the light. We should live a life of righteousness and a life that is holy as he is holy. You know, if when you say, whether you say it directly or whether you just say it in your actions, when you say, the devil made me do it, you know what you're really saying? Well, first of all, you made the wrong decision. It wasn't the devil's fault at all. But if you really believe the devil made you do it, what you're saying is the power of Satan to make you do it is more powerful than the power of God to keep you from doing it. And that's just flat out not true. Who's more powerful, God or Satan? God is. Who has more angels to work with? God does. He's got twice as many angels as there are demons out there. Who has final control over our influences? God does. God allows Satan to do everything that he does, but he can, as he sees fit, withhold that opportunity and withhold temptation for a season. He can stop Satan from even tempting you by putting a hedge around about you. Why? Because he knows it's not the moment when you can bear it. But when the temptation comes, you can just mark it down. The way for escape and the strength to escape is already there. It's at your fingertips. And if all that's true, and it is, God's more powerful and God has every ability to stop and withhold the temptation, God has more angels to guide us and work with us than Satan ever would have demons. With all of that being true, why does it seem like Satan is captivating so many more souls than God is? In fact, I would ask you this, who has more control over an individual's actions, Satan or God? And to that question, I would say the answer is neither one. You do. You make the decision. Now, God has more control over the influence upon you, clearly, definitively. But you make the ultimate decision. Neither God nor Satan forces our decisions of how to act. God could, but he won't. And Satan can't and is not allowed to by God. There's one advantage, if you call it an advantage. At least from Satan's perspective, it's an advantage. To us, it's a distinct downfall. There's one advantage, I'm going to call it, that Satan has when it comes to the human heart and the direction we go and the choices of our life. And that, he, and that is that he has the initial internal hold over our thoughts and our desires. We're all born with a nature bent towards sin. We have an internal drawing force 
in that direction. I'm asking you a lot of questions this morning, but I'm going to ask a couple more. Jesus, when he walked on the earth, was fully God and was fully man, right? Do you think Jesus had free moral choice just like we do? I think so. If not, I don't know how you call him fully man, first of all. But more importantly, in what we know from Scripture, we know that he was tempted and tempted mightily. And in fact, he was tempted in every way that we are. That's what the Scripture says. And if Jesus didn't have a choice, why would Satan have tempted him so mightily? Well, uh, yes, James here in chapter 1 and verse 13 says God cannot be tempted. And yet, we also see in Hebrews chapter 4, it says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has in all ways been tempted as we are, and yet was without sin. How are these two possible? Well, Jesus was fully God. He was also fully man. I would say that he can't be fully man without free choice. But here's, the, here's a key difference. Do you believe Jesus had inbred sin? And to that, I fully and unequivocally say, no, absolutely not. It's against the very nature of God. It would never have been allowed within the character of God and specifically within the forever spotless sinless Lamb of God. So, what we have here as New Testament Christians is this very important and critical opportunity to be without inbred sin just as Jesus was. Just as Christ was. And by the way, just as He is. Never has had it, did not have it, never will. And as we can get completely pure and righteous and clean and cleansed as he was, in fact, there's a very specific commandment to that here, right? The first part of my message was largely focused on this text from James 4, 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But then there comes the opportunity that goes with it. Draw nigh unto God, and he'll draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. That's getting rid of the actions. That's asking for forgiveness for the sins that's committed, that's repenting of them and saying, I'm not going to do them again. And then there's this next critical step. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Complete and total purification of that carnal nature, that inbred, inherent sin that we were born with. Then what happens? Our nature is exactly as Jesus was infilled and led by the blessed Holy Spirit of God himself. That gives us the perfect strength to overcome every mighty temptation externally that Satan can ever throw your way, and he has absolutely no internal hold any longer. And it makes all the difference in being able to consistently over and over and over again overcome temptation and resist sin. When one becomes sanctified, you're completely righteous not only by having your committed sins forgiven, but the carnal nature of sin removed completely. Now some would tell you that if that nature of sin wasn't there on the inside, that you can never sin again, and that's also false. That's completely false. You still have the ability and the decision to go against God and sin. To say that you can't is completely contrary to what happened in the Garden of Eden. Because Adam and Eve were created in perfection with perfect communion with God, and they still made the choice to sin and go against God. And by that choice, caused inbred sin for the rest of us throughout the remainder of time. I believe that it's possible, at least in theory, that Jesus could have made it a similar choice, but clearly he did not. He didn't have inbred sin, but he could still choose, I think. But he certainly chose the righteous way and the right way every time without exception and was without sin. Well, it all boils down to what? What's the importance here? How do we make it to heaven? 
Um, well, when sanctification is received, I believe that that freedom of choice that we have truly becomes freedom in choice. Not just of choice, but in choice. You're free to choose to begin with, but there's always this tug, right? It's drawing you one direction in the tug. Now, I firmly believe there's a drawing in the other way, too. It's the reason we were created. God created us to serve Him. And until we do that, there's going to be complete and total dissatisfaction. There's going to be nothing that feels right about life until you serve God and serve Him consistently and wholeheartedly and routinely. There's a drawing on that side, but there's also this drawing to sin that's there until you get it expunged. Until you get it removed by the infilling of the blessed Holy Spirit. You say, well, can I make it to heaven with that nature there? Well, I would say if you've been recently saved and you're walking in all the light that God's given you, yes, you can make it to heaven. But in the long term, if you're walking with God, He is going to lead you to get the inbred sin expunged from your life just in the same way that your sinful record was. It can be removed and that is when you experience true and complete glorious freedom. Freedom in God. Freedom of choice is true freedom of choice. Before that, you have the ability to choose, but the ability is affected by this unconscious desire of sin that's still there. But when that desire gets removed, this choice is truly free and unforced. And in that case, one realizes what is right, and will shun what is wrong, and will choose the characteristics of godliness for their life and for their actions 100% of the time. As long as they stay close, right? Maybe I should say nearly 100% of the time, because that choice is still there. But the choice is so much easier. Ultimately, it comes down to this. If you believe that you can't live without sinning, you're limiting the power of God. And our God has every power in every circumstance depending upon the choice that we make. You're limiting the power of God in just the same. You're admitting your lack of power. Saying, well, I can't help but sin presumes that you don't have the capability to do the right thing. You're limiting your own choice. And I promise you, you do have the choice to make the right decision every single time. You have that ability. Don't ever believe that you don't. Satan can't make you do it. You have to choose to do it. Free moral choice gives you the opportunity to choose right every time, just as equally as it allows you to choose wrong. And so, quite simply, I've got to ask, what choices have you been making? And the bottom line is this. It only takes one wrong choice of sin that's still remaining on your record to keep you out of heaven. You get sick of me saying this, but I'm going to say it again. Heaven's a holy place, home to a holy God, and only holy people are going there. I believe it wholeheartedly. And I don't have this in my notes either, but I'm going to use it this morning. And for those of you that have heard it five times, I'm sorry. But maybe you need to hear it again. I use this all the time on people that have no concept of holiness and people that come to me and say, well, you just can't help but sin and thought, word, and deed every day or at some point in your life. And so um, most often I use this at work with people that go to some other kind of, some different theology back to church. And I'll come to them and ask them this question. Can you live a minute in your life without sinning? And I've never had anybody yet tell me no. Everybody believes you can live a minute without sinning. I believe you can, right? You can live a minute in your life without sinning. I said, okay. Then can you live five minutes? Yeah, sure. Well, if you can live five minutes without sinning, can you live an hour? Most people say yes, right? If you can make it an hour, can you make it a day? And then some people start to waver and others say, yeah, I suppose you can make it a day. Well, if you can make it a day, can you make it a week? or a month, or a year, and at some point in there, these people, because of this theology that's been broken into them, or beat into them, will just eventually say, well, no, I don't think you can make it that long. And I say, why? The sin still happens in one minute. Actually, far less than one minute. 
every time it comes down to the one minute, it comes down to a moment in time when you have the ability to make a choice. And if you can make the right choice once, then you can make it again and again and again and again. And if they say, well, what if I don't know the right thing to do? Well, now we're talking about a different definition, right? Sin is those that know to do good and do it not. Sin is when you clearly go against God's law and his precepts and his character. And I'm a firm believer that it's inherent within us because of the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit to have, at least on the big obvious things, clear direction on what is right and what is wrong. When you go against the huge standards of God's law, People know it's not right. Even the most barbaric civilizations in our history deep down knew it was the wrong thing to do despite their culture. I really believe that because that's the way God creates us and he's faithful through his Holy Spirit to lead us in that. And so, again, what's your choice? When's the last time that sin was in your life? If between that time and now, there's not been a moment of confession and repentance and rededication, that I would encourage you to make the right choice to ask for forgiveness this morning and clear the channel between you and God one more time. And friend, I, I'm not going to tell you you have to do it every day because you shouldn't have to do it every day. You should be able to pray for strength and avoid the temptation. But if you're falling, God so help you if you're too stubborn to ask for forgiveness of whatever it is. Because that's the type of stubbornness that will send you straight to hell. And I, I know maybe that's not pleasant, but God help me if I'm not truthful enough with you to share that with you because I love you. I want you to make it to heaven. And you've got to have forgiveness of each and every sin and live continually victorious until the day when you're going to stand before the judgment seat. You say, how can I do that? Through the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of God, who will not put any temptation on you that you do not have a way of escape. Run. Keep your mouth shut. Forgive. Right? Serve. Work. Whatever it might be. There's different ways to escape, but it's there. God help us to do it. Stand with me together this morning.